सहनावतु सहनौ भुनक्तु सह वीर करवाहे तेजस्वीनावधी तमस्तु मिदिषा वह ओं शाति 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 गुड मॉर्निंग टुडे द सब्जेक्ट बिफोर अस इज द सीक्रेट ऑफ द फाइव शीट्स and uh, the session is going to be packed i can assure you that we have a very rich vedantic feast before us this morning um the subject is taken from the taittiriya upanishad one of the most important upanishads and in the second chapter of the taittiriya upanishad it begins with a profound sentence a profound vedic sentence brahma vidapnoti param the knower of brahman attains the highest the knower of brahman attains the highest the whole of vedanta nay the whole of religion is packed into this little statement the knower of brahman attains the highest it tells us right away that the spiritual journey is not a journey in space is not a journey in time it is a journey of knowledge from ignorance to knowledge is the spiritual journey how do we know this because the words are the knower of brahman the emphasis is on the word the knower so it's not a journey in space it's not that you have to go somewhere uh, you have to go to banaras or vrindavan you know the spiritual journey usually starts in this country by people taking up their passports and getting a visa to india or <laughs> backpacking it to india you don't have to go to india or banaras or vrindavan you don't have to go to mecca or jerusalem you don't have to go to any place you don't even have to go to heaven after death you have to go to heaven or the abode of vishnu or the abode of shiva kailash or vaikuntha no 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 it's not a journey in space it's not a journey in time either that you have to wait until such and such time when god will be incarnated back on earth again in hinduism you have so many incarnations of god so you have to wait till god comes back to earth again the second coming no you don't have to wait for a particular time you don't even have to wait until death god seems to be hiding behind the veil of death that after death a post mortem religion no it's not a journey in time you don't have to wait for something to happen it's rather a journey the upanishad tells us of knowledge from ignorance to knowledge what ignorance and what knowledge from spiritual ignorance to spiritual knowledge but what do i mean by spiritual ignorance the upanishad is very clear on the point ignorance about who or what we are right at this moment who are we what are we the upanishad claims contrary to our fondest beliefs we do not know who we are so ami vivekananda would sometimes say with a touch of pathos he would look at people you know with great sadness he would say if only you knew who you really are if only you knew yourself as you truly are so the knowledge of we do not have the knowledge of who we are that's ignorance and getting that knowledge the knower of brahman attains the highest getting that knowledge is knowledge that is spiritual knowledge so spiritual ignorance to spiritual knowledge i'm not talking about secular ignorance ignorance about physics or mathematics or sanskrit that's one kind of ignorance and that's remedied by secular knowledge but here we are talking about spiritual ignorance and spiritual knowledge so it's a journey from ignorance to knowledge brahma vidapnoti param the knower of brahman attains the highest what is brahman sat yam gyanam anantam brahma this is what we had discussed last time when we met a beautiful definition perhaps the best definition if there can be a definition of god the most beautiful definition of god that i have ever come across and we discussed it in detail last time i found this book by a christian theologian of the eastern orthodox church david bentley hart an english theologian who's written this whole book god as existence consciousness bliss and he says uh, he says this is from the hindu formulation of sat 
Chit Ananda. And he says, this is the most sophisticated definition of God arrived at by humankind ever. But that does not concern us today. God as Satyam Jnanam Anantam, translating as God is reality, God is consciousness, God is infinity. Infinite reality consciousness is God. That is the definition given by Taittiriya Upanishad. But that does not concern us today. It's not on the table. What is on the table is, how do we realize this God? Where is it? Where is this Brahman, this infinite reality? Knowing Brahman, one realizes Brahman. Well, how do we get to know Brahman? That is the question. And that's the question we shall deal with today, this morning. The Upanishad goes on to answer this question. How do we realize this Brahman? How do we undertake this knowledge, this journey of spiritual knowledge? First of all, we have to know where Brahman is. And the Upanishad says, Yo Veda Nihitam Guhayam Parame Vyoman. You have to know this Brahman as hidden in the sacred space of the cave. Mystical language. Let's see what it means. Yo Veda Nihitam Guhayam which is existing in the cave, in the sacred space of the cave. What is this cave? Where is this cave? Let's go and take a look, at, peek inside the cave and find out Brahman. Shankaracharya says that the cave is Buddhi Guha. Guha means Buddhi Guha, the cave of the intellect. But Vidyaranya, more in keeping with the Upanishad, another great post-Shankara Advaita master Vidyaranya in the Panchadashi, he says, the cave means a system of five interlocking caves. Guha means the five sheets of the human personality. Do come forward, there are a lot of seats here. Come. There are uh, these five sheets of the human personality is what is called the cave. What are the five sheets? This is what we shall take a look at. The Upanishad tells us that if we look at ourselves, we will find five layers five sheets of our being. And this is compared poetically to a cave or maybe a, a system of caves. You know, there is a saying in Sanskrit, in the Himalayas, where Vedanta is compared to a lion, Vedanta Kesari. It's, the saying goes that when the lion of, in, in the deep, dark, gloomy forests of philosophy, when the lion of Vedanta roars, all the jackals of other philosophies run for their lives. <laughs> now, I'm sure other philosophies would beg to differ. It's what the Vedantins like to think about themselves, you know. But anyway, the lion of Vedanta is in the cave. And the cave is the, this is not one cave, but it's an interlocking cave system of five caves or, or five sheets of the human personality. And that's what we are going to do. We are going to go deep into those caves and confront the lion of Vedanta, Vedanta Keshari. But you need not be scared because the lion is you yourself. It's your true nature. It's who, you, who, you, who we really are. We're going to find that out this morning. Now the method taken up by the Upanishads is that of a very good teacher. A teacher, a good teacher always takes the student from where the student is to where the teacher wants the student to be. From the near to the far. From what is to what shall be. From the known to the unknown. It's a poor teacher who comes and says, Brahman is infinity, existence, consciousness and bliss. What? But what the Upanishad says, follow me. We shall go step by step. We shall start with what is most obvious to all of us which we can, none of us can deny. We want to find out who we are. Well, the Upanishad says, who do you think you are right now? And our answer is, I'm this. This is who I am. This body. And the Upanishad starts there. It seems in ancient India, and I don't know if it's true now, when, uh, they were, when, peop, uh, when uh, the husband and wife, you know, they, they get married, and there was a, one of the rituals in the marriage is to show a faint star in the night sky called the Arundhati. Now, the bride is shown that star step by step. So first, 
you point out to a tree, a branch of a tree, the, and then they say that look at the bright star just above the tip of that branch, and then look near the, that bright star just below it, there's that faint star, and near it is another fainter star. If you point to that faint star straight away, you know it, but the girl doesn't know it. You have to take her step by step. So the objective is not the branch of the tree. The objective is not even the brighter stars. The objective is the faint star called Arundhati. In Sanskrit, this is called Arundhati Nyaya, the process, methodology of Arundhati. When you go from the known to the unknown, every good teacher does it. Any school teacher knows this method. The Upanishad says, all right, since we are most familiar with the body, let's start with the body. We think you are the body, we want to know who we are, who I am, I feel I am the body, let's start with the body. This body is called Annamaya, literally pervaded by food. This body is what we eat and drink. I heard a lecture by a scientist who said, you are food rearranged. <laughs> food is presented to you on, on, on your table in our um, breakfast or in lunch. You have food arranged in front of us. Rearrange that food and that's us. That's what the scientist said. Vedanta would agree, almost. Vedanta would say, yes, the body is food rearranged. In the name of the body given in the Upanishad is Annamaya, pervaded by food. It's a product of food. It's a modification of what we eat and drink. I often quote this Italian actress who said, the secret of my beauty, the secret of this, it's pasta. <laughs> So, Annamaya, this physical body of skin and bone and flesh, this is Annamaya. Now, the Upanishad says, take a close look at this. Are we really this body? Are you really this body? You say, why not? Well, far, far to begin with, there are so many reasons, one after another, powerful reasons, disturbing reasons, which show us that why we cannot be the body. First of all, the body changes. So, the same body was the body of a little boy or girl, then a teenager, then a young man or woman, now a middle-aged man or, or woman, an old person. So much change in the body, from that little guy to this old person, so much change. And yet we feel, I am the same person. I was the one who was a little kid, I am the one who is an old man. Vajaspati Mishra, the great 10th century uh, Vedanta scholar, he, he was a um, prodigy, he was a uh, master of different philosophies, so he has written books in different Hindu philosophies. He is called Sarvatantra Swatantra Acharya, the master who is independent of all philosophies. Anyhow, he has a beautiful book called Bhamati, which very explains uh, Advaita Vedanta. It's a commentary on Shankaracharya's commentary on the Brahma Sutras. He says, touchingly, I who was a little boy playing on the lap of my grandfather am now sitting with my grandson on my lap. Yet I am the same one. There's this elderly lady who told me just a few months ago, she was walking past a shopping window and she saw the reflection and she said, the first thought in her mind was, who's this old lady? And she says, it's me. And then she says, it just seemed this 30 years ago I was this young girl. If you think about it psychologically, what a tremendous change this body is undergoing. I don't think that I was that, I, the little guy was somebody else and the middle-aged man was somebody else and now I'm somebody else. No, I think I'm the same person. If I am the same person, the body is certainly not the same. Body is certainly not the same. Body is changing continuously. How can I be the body? Another thing, the body is always an object. Do I know the body? Yes, I am always aware of the body. I can see the body, I can touch the body. Internally, I can always feel the body. That's what's pain. And I can smell, unfortunately, smell the body. <laughs> I so all five senses operate on the body, very clearly revealed to the five senses. I am the knower of the body, the body is a known object. In Sanskrit, I am the drashta, body is drishya. How can I be the body? The knower and the known are two different entities. So the knower is me, obviously. 
That's what I feel. I never feel the body is knowing me. I look at the hand and I feel I am looking at my hand. I never get the feeling that the hand is looking back at me. <laughs> that would be so weird. We never get that feeling. Think about it. And what is true of the hand is true of the entire body. You look at the body. You sense the body. The body is not doing the, that to you. So you are the drashta, the seer. And the body is the scene. We are not the body. Other examples. Always we think of ourselves as conscious. We never think of ourselves as unconscious. And the body is something that we are conscious of. The drashta and drishya is one reason. Slightly different but related reason is what they say in Sanskrit. Body is jada, inert, insentient. We always regard ourselves as chetana, sentient, aware. We are beings of consciousness, beings of awareness. Whatever we think our, about ourselves, we first of all know that we are aware, sentient. The body is not. The, to the extent that the body is sentient, it is pervaded by my sentiency. I pervade the body as, an, as a sentient being. So, the body is not me. There are many reasons. Page after page. And you don't have to come to Vedanta. Every philosophy, yeah, I mean, Indian philosophy except the Charvaka. All the Hindu philosophies, all the Buddhist philosophies, all the Jaina and Sikh philosophies, all the... Indian philosophies will tell you, you are not the body. And they'll give you reasons, page after page of reasons. Let me give you a little more complicated reason. These are simple reasons why we are not the body. A little more complicated reason would be this. All Indian philosophies believe in the law of karma. Cause and effect. What we experience today are the effects of causes long past. The happiness and misery which we are experiencing today is due to what we have done in the past. If, if we are happy today, the law of karma tells us at some time in this life or earlier lives, we must have been particularly nice to somebody somewhere. If we are miserable today, something nasty happens to us, well, you've been a naughty boy or girl someday, somewhere, you don't remember. So, cause and effect, that is the law of karma. Now, Whatever is happening in this body since its birth must have had some cause. <coughs> Follow this carefully. The effects of which we are aware in this body from the very beginning of the, from our lives, from, from birth itself, they must have had some cause if we follow the law of karma. So those causes must have existed before the birth of the body. Hence, I must have been there in some form earlier, there must have been some other life where I have generated some karma which has led to this body. Are you with me so far? If I am getting effects in this body, happiness and misery, sukha and dukkha, the causes of that must be prior to this life. Not only that, there are many things that people do in their lives, good and bad, and they don't seem to get all the results in this life. So if they are going to get the results, they will exist after death. The body does not ac accompany them after death. So they must be apart from their body. They must not be the body. To uphold the law of karma, this is one, one, reason, uh, one of the reasons given in Vedanta. To uphold the law of karma, we must admit, admit that we existed before this body was born and we will exist after this body dies. In fact, every religion takes this for granted. Without this, you cannot have religion. Think about it. There must be some post-mortem existence. Some heaven, some hell, some kind of consequence. Otherwise, uh, there can be no religion. If death is the end, of the end of the body is end of our existence, then there can be no religion. So not only Vedanta, every religion accepts that we must be something other than the body. So for all these reasons, body is vikari, changing. From childhood, babyhood to old age, body is vikari, changing. I am nirvikara, unchanging. Body is drishya, an object of experience. I am drashta, the experiencer. Body is achetana, jada, insentient. I am chetana, sentient. 
The body is a product of karma. Comes and goes. I exist before this, before birth. I exist after death. For so many reasons. The annamaya, this thing made of food, cannot be me. And indeed the Upanishad says, the real you is something different from the annamaya. Anyantaratma pranamaya, Taitya Upanishad says, look deeper. You are something deeper than this body. What is deeper than this body? Something interior to this body. Pratyak. Antara, antara, antara means interior. Something interior, something more subtle, sukshma. Something more subtle, something more pervasive, vyapaka. What is that? The life forces. The Sanskrit word is pranamaya, pervaded by life. The life forces. What do you mean by life forces? What pervades this body? Life itself, breathing. We breathe in and out. The breathing in and out is due to the life forces called prana. When we learn yoga, we learn breathing. It is called pranayama. Pranayama means control of the life forces. There is blood flowing through our veins. There is oxygen being assimilated into the blood. There is food being converted into different parts of the body. So much is going on. A variety of chemicals is being produced in the body, biochemicals. Once, a doctor told me, Swami, I was not a Swami at that time, I was a Brahmachari, he said, Maharaj, your liver, that little liver which we have, produces so many different kinds of biochemicals that it would require a 500 acre factory to produce the kind of biochemicals one human liver produ produces. So, all these life processes, surging through our body all the time, which keeps our body alive, which maintains this body, which gives us energy. Our experience of breathing is prana. Our experience of hunger is prana. Our experience of thirst, our experience of health, energy, our experience of sickness, lack of energy, this is due to prana. The body remaining the same, the prana keeps surging like a tide throughout, throughout our body. We are healthy not so much because of the body, we are healthy because of the prana. Yoga, Ayurveda, the holistic medicine systems of the world, not only from India, from all over the world, they don't act on the body directly, they try to act on the prana. The Chinese word for that is chi, the Japanese word is ki. So they try to act on this and that produces physical health of the body. So the pranamaya, the Upanishad says, you are the pranamaya, you are life itself. And we think that, well, that seems to be a pretty um, good argument. Yes, I, th I, am, I might be life. But then when we look closely, look at the pranamaya, is it changing? Oh yes. Sometimes you are energetic, sometimes you are absolutely dead tired, sometimes I am healthy. Sometimes I am, I feel absolutely sick. It's continuously changing. The prana surges in and out of the body and it's continuously changing. And I am unchanging. I am the same person who was ill. I am the same person who is cured. But the prana has changed. I am the same person who was hungry. Now I couldn't eat a bite more. I am the same person. The prana has changed. It has, it has become satiated. So prana is changing. I am not changing. The same reasons apply. The prana is drishyam. Am I not aware of the prana? The activities of the prana? All the time. When you do the Buddhist meditation, you do follow your breath. I'm breathing in and breathing out. What are you doing? But you're becoming aware of the prana. So you are that which is aware of the prana. The prana is drishyam. You are drashta. You are the knower. The prana is something that is known. Again, you are conscious. The prana is jada in Sanskrit, insentient. And for all of these reasons, because prana is changing, vikari, you are nirvikara, unchanging. Because prana is drishyam, you are the drashta, knower and known. Prana is known, you are the knower. The prana is insentient, jada, you are sentient. For all these reasons, you cannot be the prana. You must be something deeper. And the Upanishad comes in and says, indeed, you are not the prana. 
See, first it said you are the prana. And we felt convinced. Then it asked us to look deeply. Think deeply. And you see it becomes an object. Just as this body is an object, the prana is a subtle object. You can't see it, but you can certainly feel it. So it's not you either. And the Upanishad says, Anyontaratma Manomaya. Go deeper. Look deeper within yourself. Antara means deeper. Deeper than the life processes. Pratyak, inside. Sukshma, subtler. Vyapaka, more pervasive. What can be subtler and more interior to the life processes? Says the mind. The mind. Our thoughts. Our emotions. Our memories. Indeed, our entire personality. That's you, isn't it? And we say, yeah, that's it. Right. Right now, I've, I've found who I am, really. And it is true that most of us, educated, grown-up, mature people, we identify ourselves with our personality. Do we not? That's who we think we are, really speaking. No matter how much Vedanta we read, we mostly we get stuck at the personality. I am my likes and dislikes, my ideas, my thoughts, my memories, my identity, my feelings, my personality. It's who I am. Whenever the ads, mm, advertisements, they'll say, discover who you are. What they mean is your personality. It means the mind. The Upanishad says, just a minute, not so fast. Are you aware of your mind? Yes. When I am happy, I know that I am happy. When I am unhappy, I know that I am unhappy. When I have desires, I know that I have desires. Of course, no. I want this. I want chocolate. So, I want chocolate. The desire is there and I am that which wants that. This, this, this wants that object of desire. Clearly, I cannot be the mind. Why not? Many, many reasons. One reason, of course, is the mind is something that is experienced. Just as the body is experienced, the prana is experienced, our thoughts are also experienced, our personalities are also experienced by you. Not by anybody else. They can see it from outside, see it from our behavior, but we experience our own ideas, thoughts, memories from the inside, as it were. We have a privileged, a vantage, first-person point of view. So, we experience it. If we experience it, then the mind also becomes drishyam, an object of knowledge, and I become the drashta, the seer of the mind. The mind becomes something changing, and of course the mind changes. Somebody said we have 16,000 thoughts in our waking day. Daytime, till we go to sleep, every day we have 16,000 approximately thoughts. Not different thoughts, mostly repetitive and mostly useless, but 16,000 thoughts. If they are not useless, we would be uh, wiser than any Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> but mostly they are repetitive patterns of thinking. But they are different thoughts. And I am the one to whom these thoughts come. I cannot be all of that. Desires. So many desires. And I am one. I, the desirer, if I may use such a word, am one. I don't think I am many. I am one. Until, unless I have a multiple personality disorder. But... <laughs> I think I am one person. Desires are many in number. I remember the first thing we learned in our economics class back in school. The first thing they taught us, I still remember. Human desires are infinite. Resources are limited. And thus is economics born. You studied economics? Any economics class, they'll start with that. Desires are infinite and resources are limited. And so economics comes up. Well, good for economics. But the point is, since desires are infinite, I, I don't think I am many in number. I'm just one. So how can I be my desires? They are known. They are there in the mind. They are there in the personality. But I am not that. In fact, it's very interesting that I am not the personality. I'm not the mind either. The very word personality, you know, it comes from the original, the original Greek roots, the personae. Where masks, the word personality means a mask. In Greek theater, it seems, people would, the actors would come on stage, something like this, and there were no microphones at that time, so they had to sort of shout out their parts. And they would come with these big, big masks, which they would hold in front of themselves, 
and that, then they would play their roles. So those masks came to be called the personae. And that's where the word personality has come from. Personality means a mask. It's not you. It's the mask you put on when you face the world. So I am not the mind either. And this is tremendous. Then who am I? The Upanishad says, look deeper. You are, you are right, you are not the mind. And he was telling us so, so long ago, I am the mind. Now it's telling us, you are not the mind. There is something interior to the mind, subtler than the mind. Pratyak, inner. Antara. Anyantaratma vijnanamaya. Vijnanamaya means the sheath of the intellect. The intellect and the mind are the same thing, but performing different functions. It's the same inner instrument. Uh, Vedanta tells us it's the same inner instrument, but we make a distinction based on the function. You see, what the Vijnanamaya does is, it understands. It's the intellect. And it is also the agent. When I feel I am speaking, it's not the mind. It's a certainty which is there in my mind. That certainty is produced by the sheath of the intellect, the Vijnanamaya. In fact, the best way to think about it is, right now, we are all trying to understand this using the Vijnanamaya. What we are using now, the word is buddhi, that's part of the Vijnanamaya. So the intellect by which we are trying to understand what's going on now, hopefully, is the Vijnanamaya. And am I that? I seem to be that. When I say I am Swami Sarva Priyananda, that's the Vijnanamaya. I when I say, I understand what this guy is talking about, I do not understand what this guy is talking about. That's the Vijnanamaya, which, which understands or does not understand. It's another function of the inner instrument, Antakkarana. Again, apply the same logic. Are we aware of the intellect? Yes, we are. Are we not aware of understanding? I get it. Understanding, I'm aware of that. I'm confused, I don't see what he's talking about. That's the intellect again. So I'm aware of it. I'm aware of my intellect. Am I not aware that I am Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so? I'm aware of it. If I'm aware of it, then the intellect becomes an object ever so subtle, but still an object. It's an object shining in the light of consciousness. It's an object shining in your light. You cannot be the intellect. It's your intellect, it functions in your light. You lend consciousness and sentiency and awareness to that intellect, but you cannot be that intellect. It changes continuously. So many things we understood in school, we may have forgotten so many things we did not understand in school, now we understand, and so many things remain for us to understand. So the intellect changes continuously. Yet I feel I was the same kid who didn't know calculus in school, who knew calculus in um, college, and who has again forgotten calculus now. <laughs> I'm the same person. The intellect has changed. So the intellect is also a changing object. I am the unchanging witness of the intellect. The intellect is also a known object, drishya. And I am the drashta, the seer of the intellect. And so on. All the reasons apply. Vikari, nirvikara. Drishya, drashta. Jada, chetana. All of them apply to the intellect. The intellect being closest to the Atman, very close to the Atman, it shines in the light of the Atman and it seems to be very sentient and very conscious. Much more conscious than the body is, is the intellect. But still, it borrows consciousness from you. It is not you. It is not our real nature. And the Upanishad says, we can predictably, you are right, you are not the intellect either. My goodness, what can you be? Let's look deeper. And he's, Upanishad says, Anyuantaratma Anandamaya. It's something subtler than the intellect. The Upanishad says, in deep sleep, when we go to sleep, we forget the world, we forget the body which is on the bed and sleeping. Sound sleep, snoring, that's sound sleep. That's why you call it sound sleep because somebody is snoring. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So the body is there, completely unaware of it. And if dreams are not there, if it's a dreamless sleep, deep sleep, absolute blankness. There is no intellect there either. There is no feeling of agentship or identity. I am sleeping. If you have such a feeling, you are not sleeping. <laughs> so the intellect has shut down. And yet something remains behind. After all, what comes up 
after deep sleep and says, I slept peacefully, I did not know anything. Sukham maham asapsam nakinchi ravi disham. The Sanskrit goes like this. I slept like a log. We say, I slept peacefully. I did not know anything. This not knowing something is also a kind of knowing. Something was there. If something was not there in deep sleep, what would we have said? I went to sleep and I woke up. That I have a feeling of blankness, of ignorance, of darkness in between. Something illumined the absence of the intellect in deep sleep. So hence, there is something in deep sleep which we, we experience as blankness, as deep restfulness. And the Upanishad calls it the Anandamaya, the sheet of bliss. Why the sheet of bliss? Because deep sleep is associated with untroubled rest. So the sheet of bliss. And it is this, according to Vedanta, it is this sheet, this sheet of bliss which is closest to the Atman, subtlest. This is what gives us happiness in the waking state also. When you something nice happens to us and say I, I bite into a chocolate brownie or something and I get a flash of pleasure. They say it is percolated from that sheet of bliss, Anandamaya. But that too is an object. It's experienced. Who is the experiencer of that? You are not the sheet of bliss either. You say, okay, five sheets. We have talked about, we spoken about five sheets. The food sheet, Annamaya. The sheet of life, Pranamaya. The sheet of the mind, our personality, ideas, who we think we are actually. Even that we are not, the Manomaya. The intellect which we are using right now, Vijnanamaya. And the darkness of deep sleep, the so-called bliss sheet, Anandamaya. And Upanishad says, you are none of these. Because these are all objects. They come and go, they change. You are aware of them. You are conscious and they are jada, not conscious. Though they are pervaded by our consciousness. And at this point we say, okay, five sheets, we have ticked off. Now we are coming to the point. Upanishad is going to tell us who we are. All right, give it to us. We are ready. We whip out our notebooks and our pen. Tell us. And the Upanishad keeps quiet. We expect that like the nesting dolls, the Russian dolls, nesting dolls are there, you open the big doll, there will be a smaller doll, you open that, there will be a smaller doll and so on. We expect the secret of the five sheets. Okay, we have gone through the five sheets, now the secret is going to come out. And what does the speaker do? What does the teacher do? What does the Upanishad do? Keeps quiet. Silent. Shh. How strange. At this point, there are two reactions. One is that we are trying to find out the real Atman, the real self, who am I? We have considered five sheets, one after another, and rejected all of them. We have negated all of them. Now we are looking for this ultimate reality, Brahman, which the Upanishad point, uh, pointed out. Satyam, Yanam, Anantam, Brahman. We expect it to emerge. It does not emerge. So our first reaction is, that we can't find it, number one. An immediate reaction is, it's not there. So there is no, no self. It's void. Shunyam. So the Atman promised by the Upanishads is not there at all. We have peeled the onion and found nothing else at the, in, inside it. And when you peel an onion, you get tears. So we end up with the tears. <laughs> you should have told us, I braved 101 on a fine Sunday morning to come and hear the secret of the five sheets. And here, you have nothing more to tell us. You're keeping quiet. What could be the secret? And the, and the student asks the teacher in the Taiti Upanishad. So there is no self. Now, at this point, we shall go to Vidyaranya, the author of the Panchadashi, which he wrote some 700 years ago. He gives, he makes five beautiful points here. We shall consider those and bring the talk to a close. We shall discover the secret of the five sheets and discover ourselves too. At the very least, We'll understand what the Upanishad wants to say, why it kept quiet. And if we are lucky, we might get a little flash of enlightenment also. <laughs> All right. Vidyaranya, in the third chapter of the Panchadashi, has an opponent, has a student or a questioner ask him, here are the five sheets which you have so beautifully pointed out to me. There is nothing apart from these five sheets to know. 
There's nothing apart from them to know. What else is there? Let's look at ourselves very carefully. We have found only these five things. What are these five sheets? Take an example. I'll quickly summarize what we have done so far in a sentence. Here is my hand. What I see here, the skin and inside it, the flesh and the bones and the blood, this is the annamaya, the food sheet. When I lift my hand, the energy which enables me to move my hand is the pranamaya. The thought, I must lift my hand, that's the manomaya, the mind sheath. The feeling, I am lifting my hand, that knowledge, that identity, the agent of action, kartritva in Sanskrit, that is the vijnanamaya kosha. And if there is any happiness associated with li lifting the hand, that is percolated down from the anandamaya kosha. Uh, we might smile, what happiness is there in lifting the hand? Well, go to a physiotherapy unit. <laughs> oh yes person who has had a stroke, struggling days and weeks and months and finally beginning to lift the hand a little bit. So much happiness. So that comes from the Anandamaya Kosha. So these are the five layers of our personality. What else is there? There is nothing. That is the question. Here comes the story of the ten persons who crossed the river. I have told this earlier, but it's relevant here. Ten friends crossed a river. And after they swam across, or they waded across on the other side, someone thought that, have we all crossed or did anybody drown? Let's count. And one of them counted, line up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh my God, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh my God, the tenth person, our friend is, has drowned. The other person said, you couldn't have counted correctly, let me count and he counts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And they all sit down and start sobbing. Yeah. Boos were hooed. Boo hoo. <laughs> so, a wise person inevitably walks by and he says, Why are you crying, my friends? Well, we were ten and we crossed the river and one of us drowned and so we are sad. And this person takes a quick count and he sees there are ten of them, of course. He says, How do you know that uh, the tenth person is down, drowned? Well, we counted, sir, and we can't find, we can find only nine. The wise man says, He gets it, what has happened? And he says to them, most important, calm down, don't cry. The tenth person is there, believe me. The guru comes and tells us, you are not the body and mind, you are the mortal conscious self, uh, pure consciousness itself. Believe me, right now, to begin with. They say, where is the tenth person? You haven't seen it yet, but believe me, calm down, relax, I'll show it to you. So they trust him, okay, show us, line up. And you, my friend, count. I have counted. Count. It's, I, I'll show you. You count. All right. If you say so, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that wise person comes, holds his hand, turns it around. Thou art the tenth. Ten. Dashamas tuamasi. And this person says, wait, 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 wait. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, the tenth person has been found. What joy. And his friend says, let me try it, let me try it. And he does the same thing, one, two, three, five, six, seven, nine. And they were all illumined and thus goes the story. <laughs> Vidyaranya says, though you may laugh at this story, we are always doing the same thing. We are doing the same thing. Here is the secret. What Vidyaranya says to the person who asked the question, we see the five sheets, we experience them. Where is this Atman you promised? Where is the self you promised? Vidyaranya says, watch this. What did you say? Did you not say that I experienced the five sheets? That the five sheets are experienced? Body and mind and intellect and so forth, they are experienced? Yes. If they are experienced, there must be an experiencer. True. If they are experienced, there must be an experiencer. Then who is that experiencer? What is that experiencer? This was Vidyar in his first point. You are looking for an object. What was the mistake of the person counting? He was counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. He was looking for one more. 10. Out there. The 10th one is not out there. It is the one who was counting. Vidyarnya tells us exactly like that. When you consider the body and the life forces and the mind and the intellect and the darkness beyond the intellect. Who is the one watching all of them? That one is not an object. 
your mistake, our mistake, a fundamental and very natural mistake is to look for an object. When, you t when they tell you there is an Atman, Brahman, our first unconscious natural instinct is to go out there and look for an object of knowledge called Brahman or Atman and we don't find it. We don't find it, Vidyanya says, Natu Asattaya, not because it does not exist, but it is the one who is seeking. It is not an object of seeking, it is the one who is seeking. The second point that Vidyarnya makes is that when you look, when you want to know the subject, you see, the problem is this. He says the field of knowledge, remember we are on a journey of spiritual knowledge. Vidyarnya makes an important point. He borrows from the Kain Upanishad. He says the field of knowledge is divided into the known and the unknown. There are things that we know, things, books we have read, people we have met, foods we have eaten, places we have visited. These are things which are known. And there are places we have not visited, books we have not read, theories we do not understand, people we have not met, experiences we have not had. So these are the field of the unknown. This is our field of knowledge, known and unknown. Apart from the known and unknown, what is there? No. Yes, the knower. The entire field of knowledge can be divided into the known and the unknown, but quite apart from that is the knower. That's why the Upanishad says, the one who thinks that the, the Atman is known as an object, he does not know the Atman. The one who says the Atman is unknown, he's still thinking it's an object, looking for it, he does not know the Atman. It's neither known nor unknown, it is the knower. That's the beautiful second point that Vidyarnya makes. It is the subject, it's not an object of knowledge. Objects of knowledge are known and unknown. Many things which we know, many things we do not know, we will know, many things we may not be able to know in our lifetimes. But the self, you, are none of them. You are the subject. So you are neither the known nor the un unknown. Anya devatad viditad aviditad adhi. The Ken Upanishad says in Vidyarnya quotes, the self, you, I am apart from all that I know and apart from all that I do not know. I am the <laughs> self itself. Now if I still persist, okay, I know it's not an object of knowledge, still I would like to know it. Vidyaranya gives a fantastic example. He says, consider this example. There is sugar, there is water and there is milk. If I add sugar to the water, it becomes sweet. If I add sugar to the milk, it becomes sweet. So how does water become sweet? By adding sugar. How does milk become sweet? By adding sugar. So to make something sweet, you have to add sugar. Now there are many things in the world. How do I know them? By adding consciousness. Literally meaning, you become conscious of them. By bringing them into relation with consciousness. Here is this microphone. How do I know this microphone? By bringing it into relationship with my consciousness. It's a fancy way of saying, looking at it. So I look at it. That means my consciousness becomes aware of it. So to know anything, you have to add consciousness to it. Just as to make anything sweet, you have to add sugar to it. Now if you ask, Vidyaranya says, if you ask, how do I make sugar sweet? So I have to add sugar to make it sweet? Because anything to make it sweet, you have to add sugar. If you say that, then how do I make sugar sweet? That means the rule is you have to add sugar to it. So what sugar will I add to sugar to make it sweet? It's a foolish question. Sugar has inherent sweetness, which it lends to other things. Consciousness, you don't have to become conscious of consciousness. Consciousness is what they call svaprakasha, self-luminous. It illumines everything else and reveals itself in the act of illumining everything else. Let me repeat that. In every act of knowledge, you the self are revealed. You, the consciousness, is revealed in every act of knowledge. Eyes. How are the eyes revealed? How do you know that you have got eyes? By seeing things. By seeing what? The first answer is to say that by seeing your own eyes. You don't have to see your own eyes to say that you have got eyes. You have to see, if you see anything at all, it's a proof that you have got eyes. In the same way, I am consciousness. This pure self is consciousness. It is revealed in every act of knowledge. You don't have to add consciousness to it. You don't have to make consciousness an object of consciousness. No. 
The fourth point that Vidyaranya makes is, he, he says, it is indeed shameful if we say, if, we, if I say aloud, I don't have a tongue. The very act of speaking makes it a lie that I don't have a tongue. You understand, if I say it out loud, I don't have a tongue. The very act, he says, lajja. It is a shameful statement to say, <laughs> say that I do not have a tongue. If I speak it aloud, it means I have a tongue. How did I speak otherwise? No matter what I say. Shankaracharya says, yaevasya nirakatta tasyaiva atmasa. Whoever is the denier of the self, the self is it the self of that very person. Be without that consciousness, how could you deny something? Who or what is denying? That's the fourth point Vidyaranya makes. And the fifth point is rather amusing. It's a technical point. Here is in de debate with the Buddhist nihilist. The Buddhist nihilist who says, Shunyam, the nature of the Atman is nothing, void. To be fair to the Buddhist nihilist, Shunyavadi, he actually does not say this. Though we Vedantins, we say that, we put words in their mouths. If you actually go to their scriptures, Nagarjuna's Mula Madhyama Kakarika, what he says there is very much like what we say in Advaita Vedanta. But anyway, supposing someone comes and says, the self does not exist. The five sheets are there. If you open that, like the peeling the onions, layers of an onion, nothing remains after that. It's zero, nothing. Then <coughs> Vidyarinya says, in a debate, you need an opponent. In Sanskrit, it's called Vadi Prativadi. Vadi is the person who is debating and Prativadi is the opponent who holds the opposite view. Now in this case, the Prativadi, the Buddhist Shunyavadi has said the Atman does not exist or the Self does not exist. So he does not exist. So the Prativadi does not exist, there is no opponent, hence I have won the debate. <laughs> to whom will I reply? You don't exist. If you say that there is no real Self within, it's a void. It's a technical point he's making. And I think he is half joking. He says, if my worthy opponent says that there is no Atman, the self, it's void, there's nothing, then he does not exist. The opponent is self-dissolved, dissolves himself, poof, vanishes. Whom will I reply to? So I need not reply to, any, to, to, to that question. So that's the fifth point he makes, because the Prativadi dissolves by his own admission. It's, again I'll reply and I'll point out here, the Buddhist nihilist actually does not say that. He's not really a nihilist. Uh, one interpretation of the Shunyavada school of Buddhism, the Madhyamaka Buddhism, is very Vedantic actually. In many ways it's very Vedantic. Sharat Maharaj, Swami Sharadanandaji, the author of The Great Master, he says, what they call the void, Shunyam, we call the, the fullness, whole, Purnam. What they call Shunyam, we call Purnam, exactly the same thing. So, these are the five points Vidyaranya says. See, the problem at, the, at this point when we, when we say that the, we are not the physical body, we are not the life sheet, we are not the mental sheet, the intellect sheet or the bliss sheet, the problem here is twofold. One is we feel, then where is the Atman? Which one? We are still looking for an object. And the second problem is, if you say that there is no object called the Atman, immediate reaction will be, oh, so there is no Atman. So both of these are set aside by Vidyaranya, these five points. The first point being that story of the ten uh, persons who crossed the river, it's not an object out there. Second point being, you are neither something known nor something unknown. You are the knower. Third point being, to know the knower, you don't need to add more consciousness to it like adding more sugar to make sugar sweet. It is self-revealed in every act of knowledge. The fourth point being, it is shameful to say that I do not exist. Then who is saying it? Something is there which is saying it. It's like saying I have no tongue. And the last point of course is a technical point. In a debate, both the Prativadi cannot dissolve himself, then he's lost it if it disappears. So, the conclusion we come to is, the secret of the five sheets is this Consciousness which is illumining the five sheets right now. Not only that, I'm not going into it, but I must mention it before concluding. It's not that we have separated a consciousness from the five sheets. Here are the five sheets and here is one consciousness. 
Then the Upanishad goes on to tell us that it is this consciousness alone which appears as the five sheets. I'll repeat that. The five sheets of our personality, the body, mind and so on, they are not objects separate from consciousness. They arise in our consciousness. They have no objective ex existence apart from consciousness. In fact, I'll tell you, the Upanishad can be a little misleading. What it is doing is asking us to go deep within ourselves to discover this existence consciousness place, the witness consciousness within, the witness of the five sheets. That's what we have been doing so far. But it's misleading in the sense, it's just like saying, if, if somebody says, here is a huge wave, and you say the reality is water, how will you discover water? If I tell you, go deep inside the wave, you will find water. You don't have to go deep inside the wave. The wave, the whole thing is water. It's just the form and a name. In the same way, these forms of the body, of life, of mind, of intellect, and the blankness beyond the intellect, they arise and shine in our consciousness and subside within our consciousness. The whole thing is consciousness. That is what the Upanishad is going to point out uh, after this secret of the five sheets. Discover pure consciousness and then see the entire system of caves as nothing more than pure consciousness. Names and forms, body and mind, arising and shining and subsiding back into consciousness. All of it is consciousness. All of it is existence, consciousness, infinity. Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam, Brahma. Just as you don't have to go deep within the table to discover wood, you don't have to go deep within a clay pot to discover clay, or deep within a wave to discover water. It is all water, or all clay, or all wood. In the same way, all the five sheets, once we realize what pure consciousness is, they are all pure consciousness. That is our true nature. Having discovered that, we discover an immortal, unchanging reality. Mortality is in the body. Disease and decay are in the life, life forces. Happiness and sadness and desire and frustration are in the mind. Ignorance and knowledge are in the intellect. All of these are in the five sheets. None of them are in the pure consciousness which, which we already are at this moment. We are immortal, pure, infinite consciousness existence. Right now, as Swami Vivekananda said, if only you would see yourself as you truly are. Right now. All of spiritual life, we'll discuss that later, all of spiritual life is meant to bring us to this understanding, not in a lecture, not in notes, but actually as a living reality. Just as today we feel we are this body, we must feel, actually know, realize that we are infinite existence consciousness.